Well, good afternoon. It is it is Sunday afternoon, April 19th, and I'm uh, sending you your video lecture here for pre-AP. Uh, I'm sure some of you know that today is a very special day in American history. April 19th, 245 years ago today, the shot heard around the world was fired at Lexington, and the American Revolution began on April 19th, 1775. We've also had some unfortunate incidents on this day. 25 years ago today, April 19th, 1995, the Oklahoma City bombing that killed uh, a lot of people in the Federal Mural Building in Oklahoma City by a guy named Timothy McVeigh, who was disgruntled with U.S. government, took a bunch of innocent lives. And then 27 years ago today, on April 19th, 1993, you had the Branch Davidian Complex, and I believe it had been a 58-day holdout outside Waco, uh, burned to the ground. Almost 100 people lose their lives outside Waco, Texas, at a place called the Branch Davidian Complex. But April 19th, a very active day, or a lot of a lot of things going on in American history. We are going to be testing on Friday, April 24th. Now, what I've already sent you links for is that, that there will be a we'll Zoom on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at our normal time, and on Thursday at 2 p.m. from 2 to 3, where I'll be available to answer any questions you have about the test that we're going to be taking on Friday. Don't have the exact format of it yet. Again, this is all new, posting a test, but I'll have it figured out here in the next couple of days on how that's going to look. I'll talk with Mr. Garcia and see what that format should look like. But it'll be an online test that you'll take on Friday, April 24th. So what we're going to do this week is take Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and finish the study guide. Thursday will be a review day. And that's when, again, we'll have those times and those links uh, at 2 o'clock for you guys so that we can answer any questions. Again, remember Thursday from 1230 to 120 is the foreign language uh, Zoom meeting time. So that's what the week looks like. So you're going to have to put up with me for, uh, for the next three days. We'll keep these things to 20 minutes or so. Uh, then, again, where you can go back and you can take your time and fill in your study guide if you want to make whatever notations. So... You've taken, you've done your reading, you've taken the quiz, you've done your notes. So let's get started here. Look at this page here on your study guide up at the top, Dorothea Dix, and discussion of what prison should look like. So find that page, and that's where we're going to go uh, press on with our lecture here. Now, what Dorothea Dix did was, and again, some of you are familiar with this because you've already talked about her, was... Uh, she was a lady living in Massachusetts, and she, oh, by the way, we have a guest here today with us. She's uh, going to help me. She's going to be my student, Sky. What do you think? <laughs> Sky. Uh, she's already, uh, I've already, in that short time, I've already put her to sleep. How about that? But she's always my audience when I talk to you here from my office. So Dorothy Dix was a person who had actually gone to uh, a prison in Massachusetts and saw the horrible conditions. And what was happening is you had the mentally ill, the insane, being thrown in with very violent criminals, uh, caged, chained, uh, inhumane conditions. And she put forth the uh, notion, or she's she's the mother of prison reform here in this country. Uh, they're the lost people that the society's outcast to the lowest rung of the socio or social ladder here. Uh, prisons and people, once they've locked them away and put them away, people tend to forget about them. But she wanted to be remembered. Now, if you look at it from a biblical perspective, in Matthew 25, uh, when Jesus is talking about uh, all the nations of the earth gathered around the throne of God, uh, at the at the end of time, he there's five criteria. He lists: When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink of water. When I was I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I was sick in the hospital, you came to see me. And then the fifth one: When I was in prison. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. And it says that the people asked, when did we do this to you, Lord? And he says, inasmuch as you've done this to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. And so Dorothea Dix, uh, taking on the heart of Jesus and the heart of God, and all those pictures there painted in Matthew 25 are pictures of helplessness, or people that can't, or they're, they, they're down and out, or they're helpless. And in prison, you're pretty helpless. And so Dorothea Dix said, it's our Christian duty that we... Um, change prison and how we treat people. Yes, they may have done something wrong. Yes, they may have done something. Uh, they have broken the law, but that doesn't mean that you turn them into animals, you cage them like animals, and then those who can't help themselves, particularly the mentally ill, 
they need to they need to be treated humanely and fairly. And so our prison system has changed. Uh, it went from a, the stocks and public humiliation uh, to chain gangs on roads to what we have now, what's known as the penitentiary system, where you take people and then you isolate them somewhere so they can think about what they have done and reform their ways. And hence the term penitentiary, the word penitent, which is what that comes from, which is also where the word repent comes from, you know, so that people can turn their ways. And that's the whole the idea of the modern prison system today, that people see the error of their ways and they, they repent. This is also going to be a time coming out, if you look at the next thing there, transcendentalism on your sheet. It's going to be a time here where uh, you're going to have these thinkers come along. And what transcendentalism basically was, I'm changing the page here, was that it was the idea, the idea that through meditation, just by meditating and thinking, right, that one can take themselves to a higher plane of thought and reasoning instead of just looking at the sky and saying the sky is blue. Uh, they say, well, why is the sky blue? And then put all, put all the reasons, then, or why does it change colors? Why are the clouds the way they are? Instead of just looking at it, it was a whole idea of just, I can go to a higher plane of thought through meditation. Uh, look at your page there, you see Ralph Waldo Emerson. He is considered the father of the transcendentalist movement. And it was the first great writer of the transcendentalists. Uh, he's going to have a lot of people that are going to uh, feed off of him. Uh, and his, and one of those guys is named Henry David Thoreau. He is, um, we'll get to him in a little bit when we get to the Mexican War, but uh, he was a transcendentalist also, and his most notable work is that he, Emerson let him use outside Boston. Emerson had a, a large, a lot of land, and on this land there was a pond, and this pond was called Walden's Pond. So what Henry David Thoreau does is he buys into this transcendentalist movement, and for two years, he'll live at this pond in isolation. Uh, he'll build a little cabin for himself and where he'll just sit in nature and he'll write a book. I don't think you guys have had to read this because I asked the other class when we were at the U.S. History One guys. Uh, I had to read it in ninth grade. It was a painful experience for me, but it was called On Walden's Pond. And it's, uh, it's just his views of what happened with him living out in this pond for two years and his reflections and thoughts. Uh, but he's going to be one of the uh, leading transcendentalists. Uh, he's going to be also what I call America's first hippie because the transcendentalist movement is going to pop up in the mid-19th century, and he is also going to be uh, a gentleman that's going to be being opposed to the war with Mexico, which we're going to get to here later in this chapter. And the reason I call him America's first hippie is, well, this war is wrong, and so I'm not going to support it. And so he refused to pay taxes. Well, you can't do that. If you refuse to pay taxes, the government will find you, uh, and, and they'll and they'll push you away, uh, lock you up. That's what they, that's how they got Al Capone in Chicago. It was actually tax evasion, not murder and racketeering and bootlegging. But he didn't pay taxes, and so uh, Henry David Thoreau will be jailed as a result of him not paying taxes with the war with Mexico because he thought it was wrong. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, Utopians and Millerites. I'm Utopia. If um, I'm sure you know what that is, but Utopia is a place that where everything's perfect. And there was a movement in this country by a group of people called the Utopians that thought that they could create a utopia. But the biblical fallacy of that is, is that because we're all flawed individuals and flawed beings, there is no perfect place. Now you're going to have sin, you're going to have evil, so utopia can't exist. So their whole system was flawed from the beginning. And then our other fellow there, Mr. Miller, uh, William Miller, was a guy that he said, he said he had done calculations, uh, gone and looked at scripture, and he knew the day that Jesus was coming back, or he could come for his return. And his initial thing is that he said, Jesus is going to come in March of 1843 and return to earth. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What is the biblical fallacy of William Miller's statement where he says, I know when Jesus is coming back. You probably know the answer uh, because in the Bible it says Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming back. The angels don't know. Only the Father in heaven knows when he's coming back. And so William Miller, though, will have a large following of people who will buy into his statement 
And so there again, knowledge and understanding comes into it. You have to have knowledge and understanding and education to come into play here. Because if you understood scripture, you would know that William, what, million, what William Miller is selling is just not true. He does not know when Jesus is coming back. But he'll have a large following that will follow him and he'll convince them to sell all their earthly goods because they're not going to need them. And that to go by a white robe. And that at this appointed time of this day, that William Miller and his followers are going to, go in, going to go to a high, not quite mountain, but a high hill. And so that they could be the first to meet Jesus. Because if you know what, what it's supposed to be like when he comes back, when Christ comes back, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then those who are left behind will follow and meet him in the air. And so what William Miller was, his, his whole thing was, well, if we already have our robes and we're a higher elevation than everybody else, then we'll be at the front of the line when we get to meet Jesus there. Uh, and so these people, these people bought that and they believed that. Uh, and then they, uh, the day came and the day went and well, Jesus didn't come back that day, but he convinced these people said, ah, I've miscalculated. I made a miscalculation. He's actually come back in 1844 and they'll do it. They'll repeat the process again. Well, what's going to happen with that obviously is that Jesus didn't come back in 1844 and all these people, a lot of the people that had followed him are, are of course, going to be disgruntled, they're going to fall away, but there will still be people that will believe what William Miller is selling. And he, what they are now, the Millerites, become, came, became known today what was known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, that they know when they still like Christ is coming and that they're going to be the chosen and the select. There are, if you want to look on your own, just what some people have followed uh, in the past, American citizens that are supposedly bright and intelligent, look up the Jim Jones and the Jonestown, if you want to enter now, uh, Jim Jones and Jonestown that occurred where a group from California believed this guy, Jim Jones, had moved to Guyana, and then basically he imprisoned him, but it ended up being the largest mass suicide, uh, almost a thousand people. Uh, if you've ever heard the term, oh, you're drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, this came from that where, in the end, these people chose to commit suicide by drinking cyanide-laced Kool-Aid. And uh, men, women, and uh, the point of stuff down their children is terrible. And then if you want to look up another one, look in the mid-90s. There was something called the hale Bach Comet and Father Raw Doe, where this guy was convinced that there was a, a spaceship behind this uh, comet that would take people to eternal bliss. Uh, but to do that, you had to shed the shells. So you had these people on their own in San Diego, California, uh, decide to commit suicide at an appointed time, all wearing Nike shoes and a purple blanket. Anyway, if you're interested in that, look it up. The Jonestown uh, mass suicide thing or the Hale-Bopp Comet and Father Raw Doe, and that people bought this stuff. Uh, they're gullible. Well, Jesus even warned us about that, though. He said, there will be many coming in my name, proclaiming things and doing miracles, but be on guard, beware, don't follow them, don't follow these false preachers, stay the course, and those that stay the course will be redeemed. Uh, moving on here to our next one here. We have the American Temperance Society uh, that is formed here, uh, that there's a difference between temperance and prohibition. Uh, and we're, in both these instances, we're talking about alcohol. There was a big growing faction in this country that believed that alcohol was the source of problems for the family unit. Uh, men were drinking per capita 17 to 18 gallons of whiskey a year, meaning that if you understand statistics, that every man, woman, and child was drinking statistically 17 gallons of whiskey. Well, we know that's not the case. Babies and women are not drinking that much whiskey, so it's the men doing the drinking. And so you're going to have a movement uh, driven by a lot of women and about some men also more, for you to form there, the American Temperance Society. And it was based on the belief that America's problems could be solved if people would abstain from the consumption of alcohol. Well, with that, that requires a voluntary a part on some people to say, well, okay, I won't do that anymore. I choose to abstain as opposed to uh, prohibiting it by law. And uh, that works up to a certain point, but in the end, people are gonna do what they wanna do. And uh, then you had out of that came society, which went from people just voluntary abstinence to no, people aren't gonna do what they're supposed to do. They're not gonna follow the rules. So what we're going to do, 
is we're going to prohibit. And so there was a movement to make alcohol illegal. The problem with that is that it's not, and we learned that with the passage of the uh, 18th Amendment in the early 20th century, you cannot regulate morality. You can put laws in place to protect people, but if somebody wants to go smoke a cigarette or if somebody wants to go have a drink, you can't regulate that morality because in the end, they're going to find a way to do it. And so you have in government what are called unintended consequences. And so while intentions were good, uh, the 18th Amendment was born out of this movement in the mid-19th century that will manifest itself in the early 20th century uh, with the passage of the 18th Amendment prohibiting alcohol. Well, what came out of that was people still got their booze, but what you would have gave way, uh, rise to was organized crime, which uh, bootlegging, that which led to racketeering, gambling, and control. And so you had these low-level thugs in Chicago and New York that were ended up being able to take control and get rich. Again, Al Capone being one of those people, so much so that 14 years after it's ratified, they say, you can't do that. And so then the 21st Amendment comes along in 1933 and repeals the 18th Amendment, and which made alcohol legal again. I uh, just found out. And the other thing the federal government found out about that was all of the lost revenue from taxes on the whiskey that they were doing. Canada was the one getting rich because people were buying Canadian whiskey and then bootlegging or running in on ships uh, here into America. And then you're going to have uh, Neil Dow here of Maine. Neil will uh, go on to uh, achieve Civil War fame. He'll rise to the rank of general during the American Civil War, but he was what was called a teetotaler. Uh, teetotaler meaning that I'm not going to drink alcohol at all, that it's 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 uh, not good and it's illegal, but it's the governor of Maine. He's going to actually, for the first time in American history, a state will enact prohibition, uh, which made alcohol, the consumption of alcohol, transportation, manufacture, any of that alcohol illegal, making it a criminal offense in Maine. And what they found out in Maine is that didn't work. It didn't work, but 60 years later, seven years later when the uh, 18th Amendment was being they, they didn't go back and look at history and say, well, it didn't work on a state level. It's not. It's certainly not going to work on a national level. But a lot of this was born out of, and what you're going to get to tomorrow is the women's suffrage movement. And if the, if the husband or the father or the man is not doing what he's supposed to be doing, and he's, he's not leading, then somebody's going to have to step in the gap, and you're going to have mom step in or the wife step in and play the role of mother and father, and that's not what that's not what that's what it's designed to do, and that's why you have problems. And and women and rightfully so are going to get upset at this to the point where they say, "Look, we want to have a say so. If you're not going to lead, if you're not going to lead, we want to have a say so in our self determination." Now, this temperance movement, out of the suffrage movement, which will get tomorrow, you'll have borne out the Nineteenth Amendment, uh, which is we're actually celebrating 100 years this year. Uh, that in 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified, giving women the right to vote. And so there are some very old people, but there are people that are alive today uh, that were alive when women couldn't vote. My grandmother and my great-grandmother were born during a time when women couldn't vote. They didn't have to say so. Uh, so my great-grandmother, who was born in 1890, was 30 years old when this was passed, and she lived till I was in college. So it's not, it's not for this way that women... Uh, women had a say in their determination. So uh, with that, uh, actually, we'll do one more. The Seneca Falls Convention of 1848. Uh, and out of this, out of this movement here, was born this, was born this, what's called the women's suffrage movement or the women's rights movement. There's a women's rights and there's women's suffrage. Suffrage just simply means that women should have the right to vote in, in government. And so you're going to have this uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, these women's activist leaders that are going to meet uh, in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, where they're going to have a declaration of rights. And it's going to simply be this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and endowed by their uh, creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So they just had that addendum in there. It's not just men created equal. Women are created equal also. And uh, if for the women's rights movement, Seneca Falls is seen as that watershed moment where women, the gates burst open and you have the formation of the genesis of the women's suffrage movement. So with that, that's a good place to stop for today. So again, this is Monday. This I'm taping this on Sunday, but this will be for Monday for you to watch. Again, Zen will be available 
uh, 12.30 to 1.30 tomorrow, or actually 1.20. And then again, we're testing on Friday uh, over chapters 14 through 17. And then we will have a Zoom review time on Thursday for pre-AP from 2 to 3. So you should have those links. You should have those notifications. And with that, I sign off. Uh, we'll see if she, she's still. Mm -hmm. Did she? No, I don't think she's terribly interested. Uh, that's that's what I do for her. Put her to sleep and good nap time. Okay. Well, I hope all of you are doing well. And we're doing this. Hopefully we're coming out of this. We're on the back side of this. Uh, looks like some things may be starting to open up May 1st, May 15th. I don't think I, we're coming back, obviously, this year. But if we can get this behind us, we'll return to some normalcy. Uh, but one thing out of this is miss is like, ah, I miss all you guys. I mean, there's the joy of my job is to get to be around you. And even then, it's not a job. I just enjoy I enjoy what I do, and I enjoy the interaction. So hmm, this, is, this is different. But uh, if anything, it'll make me and hopefully you appreciate more uh, what it is we get to do. And so with that, uh, I bid you a farewell. Godspeed. God bless your families and you. And uh, we will uh, we'll see you tomorrow on Zoom if you want to be there. If not, look for one of these. Again, you'll have another one of these on Tuesday as we work our way through the packet. And then we will finish up with the packet on Wednesday, review Thursday, and then test on Friday. So, miss you guys. Bye-bye.